So it's the one prata day, the lunar observance day, or literally in Thai, it's the monk's day. But this word prat, it means both monk and also that which is noble. So during the time of the Buddha, there were also monks in other religions as well, um, people who had ordained in other religions, and they would gather together on these uh, lunar observance days. And so the Buddha established this as a tradition in Buddhism too, that both the monks and laity would come together to listen to teachings. So now the time has changed and we usually come to the monastery on a Saturday or a Sunday instead. But we still also keep this tradition of, of holding this, uh, the lunar observance days as the time for listening to the Dhamma. We come to the monastery to practice as well. But if we're not able to come on these lunar days, then it's okay to arrive on Saturday or Sunday as well. Now there's uh, social media and the different <clears throat> apps that we have. And so people are reminding others that today is this Lunar Observance Day. And so it's a good day to make merit, to do skillful deeds. This can help to remind us of this. Sometimes we forget, but then uh, someone reminds us through one of these apps. And so we remember. And remember to take up the precepts, to offer food to the monks when they're on arms rounds, to do various good and skillful deeds. We may come to the monastery and take the eight precepts as well. <laughs> And it's right to change this to a Saturday and Sunday. So we come to practice, to train our minds, because the mind that is well trained will bring us happiness. But if we don't train our hearts, then they're lost. We see that um, some people on these days, um, today, they are gambling. And so it's very easy for people to gamble online these days. Now, everything happens online. And young people can do this as well. And so many people's minds are with unwholesome objects. They're associating with fools. And this brings the mind down, makes it gloomy and sad. But for us, on this day, uh, we've come to the monastery We've come to do good things. We've come to train our hearts to make them better. Because these hearts of ours are something that bear great important, importance for us. They have great value. We see that all of the wealth in the world, all of the precious gems, and everything that's valuable, it doesn't have the same worth as the jewel of the Buddha or the jewel of the Dhamma, or the jewel of the Sangha. So if our minds um, receive this, and they're able to acknowledge this, um, and then we practice uh, following this triple gem, and the mind becomes very bright. So we won't be um, so interested in the wealth of the world we see that the triple gem has far more value. <clears throat> and if we do good things, if uh, we create merit, then our hearts become very bright, they become radiant. We see that all the things of this world, um, that if someone were to come and offer us everything, um, give us the whole lot, we wouldn't want it. All of the money, all of the jewels, and everything that's considered precious. If the whole world was made of these things, we wouldn't be interested. Because we see that uh, the Dhamma is more important. Because we have this Dhamma within our hearts, we have the fullness and the rapture that it gives us. And this 
gives us far more value. We can't um, take anything to compare with it. Even the wealth and the happiness of a wheel-turning monarch, um, a great emperor, it can't compare with the Triple Gem. It's tiny in comparison. Even though this emperor has such vast amounts of wealth, um, it's just tiny in, compared, in comparison to the Buddha, the Dhamma, and the Sangha. It's tiny in comparison to someone who's reached just the first level of awakening, the Sotapanna. And so we do need to come to develop our minds, to make them better, to bring them up um, to a higher level. And for Sotapannas, they're those who have abandoned, have abandoned things externally and internally. And when we give up, when we sacrifice, then what do we get? What we gain is in our hearts. We gain this internal goodness. We gain merit. We gain skillfulness. So when we abandon, when we let go, then uh, what we're doing is we are giving up this external happiness and the fun that we have in the world. And instead we get... Uh, merit in its place, its internal wealth. And so when we make offerings, and like everyone has, it's not easy to do that, because first you need to work to get that money. And in working a job, there are many different difficulties that you have to deal with, many different types of people, and you have to... Um, meet with all of their emotions, requires a lot of endurance, really have to forbear with many difficulties, and use all of the mindfulness and wisdom that you have available. There's also a lot of competition involved to get that money. But having gained it, we give up, we sacrifice one part of that in order to gain merit in our hearts. And this merit becomes a refuge, something that we can rely upon in this world and in the next world. And just like if we have to travel a very far distance, then we need some supplies to make it there. So in the cycle of samsara, we need the goodness that we gain from, from our generosity, from our virtue. So the sila is something that gives us beauty, because we're not harming any beings. No beings in um, the cycle of samsara are we doing any damage to. And it also allows us to, or creates the causes for long life and for undergoing very little illness. So therefore developing uh, dana and sila, it gives us this internal wealth, the noble wealth. So Sila works to clean and purify the heart, making it radiant. And as we carry on doing that, then it will gain the quality of Samadhi. It will collect together and become firm. So when we develop Samadhi, then what we're doing is we're raising our hearts up to an even higher level still. we see that even though we may have a lot of wealth externally, it's possible for our hearts to still suffer. We may uh, be very anxious, and we may um, have to, at times, or we will have to, at times, separate uh, or be left uh, from or by the people that we love. And this is something that the Buddha taught for monks to contemplate on a daily basis that we have to be separated from the things that we love and hold dear. So everything that we find pleasing, all of the wealth that we have, including this very body of ours, we have to separate from that. So the mind leaves the body in the end. 
But it's really not just the end that this happens. It's every single day. We don't have to wait until death. With every day, um, time passes, we get older and our life gets shorter. So the sun comes up and our life gets a bit shorter. And the sun goes down and one day has passed already. And things change in this way. And then we slowly progress through life from the age of 50, 60, 70, 80. And if someone's reached the age of 80 already, then they're very lucky. Because these days, um, the life expectancy is about 75. It used to be more than that, but it's gradually decreasing, and now it's just 75. So if we are able to make it to this age, it shows that we have a lot of merit. And life is becoming shorter and shorter, steadily. So we shouldn't be heedless. We should use this opportunity to develop goodness, to follow the teachings of the Buddha. And the Buddha taught uh, Venerable Ananda to contemplate death very frequently. Venerable Ananda said that he contemplated it uh, seven times a day. And the Buddha responded that that's not enough, that the Buddha himself contemplates death with every in-breath and out-breath, shows that the Buddha's mindfulness was complete already, it was very full. He was an arahant, someone who had reached purity, the heart that didn't have kilesas. He was able to attain to this awakening through his own means, his own efforts. But he couldn't, um, he can't do this for us. What he can do is tell us the way. He can give us the methods to reach this for ourselves, but he isn't able to extract the defilements from our hearts by himself. This is something that we have to do. But he teaches us. He tells us what to do. He has the kindness and compassion to do this. And so we need to follow. We need to practice ourselves in order to remove these defilements. Even so, the Buddha's teachings and the aid that he can give us is of great value. It's an enormous amount of help. That he, it's an enormous amount of help uh, for us so that we can attain to the Dhamma ourselves. So the Buddha was able to, was the supreme teacher of devas and humans. And he could explain the Dharma perfectly. He was able to know the minds of other beings, know who was ripe to attain to the Dharma, and exactly how he should teach that person. And then he would teach them in that way. So the great qualities, uh, the virtues of the Buddha, are boundless. And through these great virtues, people were able to see into the Dhamma for themselves, a great number of people. But there were also many beings during the Buddha's time who didn't gain this knowledge, who weren't interested, and they ended up by creating a lot of demerit, a lot of evil. So really, the Buddha is still here with us. So we should try to train our minds and do this every single day. Maybe every Lunar Observance Day we can come to the monastery and be devoted to creating goodness and take up these precepts. And also outside of the Rains Retreat we should do this as well because life is not sure. and We don't know whether our lives are going to last until the next Rains Retreat. So we build up this goodness we build up uh, or do skillful actions. And we create this internally in our hearts every single day. And in the end, the mind becomes full. Uh, The practice of sila, samadhi, and panya, of virtue, samadhi, and wisdom becomes complete. And we're able to abandon all defilements and see the Dhamma. In seeing the Dhamma, we become the Sangha. But it's not necessary to take ordination to do this. This is just the Samuti Sangha, the conventional Sangha. 
those who shave their heads who put on the robes. It's a very good thing to do, and they're cultivating their sila barami through doing this. But it also requires another ordination, an ordination of the heart. And this inner ordination is something that both the laity and monastics can do. Children and adults are able to do it. Uh, to reach um, this state that the Buddha himself had reached. So to do this, we need to develop mindfulness. And in growing our mindfulness, then our hearts gather together into samadhi. So we should contemplate a lot. We should practice this way a lot and develop our minds a lot. So we understand that all of the wealth that we gain in this world is just something that's been lent to us. It's not something that we own. And really it's not able to give us all that much benefit because it belongs to this world. And this body is just something that we've borrowed from the world. But do we see that? And if we borrow something but we don't give it back, then we're going to have to be forced to return it. Just like um, in some countries, if you borrow money but you refuse to return it, um, then there'll be consequences and people come around and uh, make you return that money. So we contemplate into the body in this way. That usually we think of it as being me or belonging to me, but really it's just something that we've borrowed from the world. And we can think that if it really was mine, well then how would it be then? That we don't want for it to get old, but it still gets old just the same. We don't want for it to experience pain, but it gets painful. We don't want to be separated from the things that we love and hold dear in this world, and from our wife or from our husband, from our parents, from our children, from our friends, from the objects or the money that we have here. We don't want the separation, so then why do we experience separation? It's because these are all things that we've borrowed. And this body is just something that we've taken from this world. All of the elements that uh, comprise this body, all of the uh, hard things, the liquid things, the gaseous, and the energy in it, the heat, these are all things that come from this world. And in time, we have to give them back. And really, we're slowly returning it, gradually, but steadily. And so we can't keep it, we can't own it forever. It's something that we need to give back. And this body needs to get old, it needs to get sick, it does need to die. And really, nature is trying to tell us this all the time. It's trying to inform us of this. Um, so we should contemplate into this nature until we gain an understanding, until wisdom arises. But for wisdom to come up, it needs this quality of samadhi. And for samadhi to arise, what we need is virtue. So this practice or this path of sila, samadhi and panya is a noble path. It's that which is able to take us out of suffering, whether small bits of suffering or great anguish. Because if we don't walk this way, if we don't train on this path, then sangsara goes on without any end. And the Buddha taught in this way um, that uh, the lives that we have had in this world or in sangsara are very, very many. We can't count how many. And there's, and also every single life that we are born into, we experience suffering in that. So the Buddha taught that if we were to accumulate or gather up all of the tears that we have shed through each of our lives in sangsara, then they would amount to more than all the water in the great oceans. 
we can think, well, just how much water is there in all of these oceans? It's a huge amount. But the tears we have shed, and through the sorrow we've experienced, and through the pain we've felt at having to leave those that we love, it's even more than the water in the great oceans. It shows that the lives that we have lived are very, very many. But if we don't practice, if we don't follow this path, <coughs> then the lives that we'll have to experience and the pain we'll have to experience in the future also goes on without end. So the, for the Buddha to develop his Bharami, he had to be born many, many times, countless times. He had to take birth and then die many times. And there's no place in this world that the Buddha hasn't passed away. So we just think, well, how many times must that have been that he had died? And this was all so that he uh, would develop his Bharamis <coughs> to be able to find the Dhamma, to come and teach us. And it's really not easy to come to this Dhamma, to find it, because it's the highest, most noble thing. It has more value than any uh, wealth that we could find in this world. And for us, we've had the good opportunity to meet with it now. So if we don't use that to put it into practice, then we've wasted this opportunity. And just like if we, um, or just like someone who is born into this world and manages to accumulate great wealth, manages to become a billionaire, the richest person in the world, well, what do they do from that point? Even if they're very powerful, they're very wealthy, well, then what do they do with that? Because all that they have really belongs to this world. And in the end, they'll have to give it all back. But the Dhamma that the Buddha found is something that we can take with us in our hearts. It's something that's able to, um, or rather, he taught us to change the material objects that we have so that they become uh, mental objects. They're something that we can take with us. Uh, when we die, our hearts are able to take them over. Namely, the generosity that we do, and then also the virtue that we keep in the meditation that we engage in. This training that leads us to peace, that leads us to a joy that we've never felt before. And this gives us great energy. The energy that comes from uh, extracting the thoughts that we have or allowing them to fade away. And that the uh, constant proliferation that normally goes on in our mind gets quieter and quieter. And so the mind is able to settle down into peace. And there's a buoyancy both of our bodies and our minds. So when we're born into a life, um, we, all of us, experience suffering. And for most people, they're not able to find a path out of this. But we think of how to get out. Um, and perhaps we remember some experience that we've had before, some peace that we've had in the past. And what was that like? And we can remember the times that we have practiced and felt, and felt uh, a fullness internally through that. So there was one time when I was younger, when I was a student, uh, one of my teachers, um, I saw him get very angry at the students and he picked up a piece of chalk and threw it at them. But in just a moment, he was able to calm down, and he looked very peaceful, and he was suddenly cheerful. And so I was wondering how it was that he was able to um, change his emotion so quickly, how he was able to put down his anger so well. So I asked him, and he said that he practiced vipassana, his inside meditation. And he said that he was able to teach me it as well, if I was interested. 
And so I did some of this meditation. But I also wanted some special experiences to experience visions. Um, but this was just out of kilesa. It was just some desire that I had. And I'd never gained this. I wanted to uh, be able to visualize a Buddha image in my mind, uh, to visualize the Buddha grow very large. Uh, but this was just thinking that I had, and I didn't have any samadhi. I was just a child then, just 18 years old. But later on in my life, when I experienced a lot of stress, um, then I thought about that uh, peace that I'd had during that meditation. I mean, my mind felt very light, and I wanted to get back to that state again. So when we have delusion like this, um, then we can also think of how to get out of that, try to find a path out of that. But it's normal that if our minds are very dark, then we're not able to find a way out. Perhaps we may read scriptures or read teachings um, by very intelligent teachers, but we're just not able to find a path out of the suffering. What we need to do really is just to practice, is to meditate, to develop samadhi so that our hearts become still. And through the stillness, then wisdom can arise. And we gain knowledge, the knowledge which is able to solve all of the stress that we experience. So samadhi is something that is very important. And because when we're experiencing the suffering, then it's able to help us greatly. And also the merit and the parami, uh, the spiritual maturity that we have developed, can help us to solve our suffering as well. And help, help us to find a way out of the suffering. Because if we can't find a way out, if the heart doesn't have any nourishment, then it's easy for it to get depressed, to become dejected. But when we have this merit, when we have built up our spiritual maturity, um, then we will be able to find a way out. So I ask uh, for the Dhamma to protect all of you, and may all of you practice the Dhamma and grow in the Dhamma. <laughs>